Hello, welcome back to our journey through the National Monument to the Forefathers. We are to the statue of education. So let's go here and look at it. And as always, I'm Libertas. You can find all this information on our website at libertyman.online. That's libertyman.online. So let's share screen and go back to the monument. Education is shown here as a seated figure. She's a young woman. And she's wearing the crown or the wreath of the high expectations placed upon youth by the pilgrims. Also, this is a laurel wreath, which in the ancient Greek and Roman times was considered um, paramount to a gold medal at the Olympics. So this is a crown of victory and the accomplishment of what they did with education. She's also, if you look here, she's looking out in a teaching manner and she's pointing here at this book. And this is called the, the book of knowledge. And it could be any book of useful knowledge, but we know for a fact that the primary book for their education was the Bible. And so we're gonna look at some early Massachusetts laws that indicate, indicate that and tell you exactly how that happened. So, but also this indicates the responsibility of the women in educating the children at home even before they were old enough to go to school. There were founding fathers that had read through the entire Bible by the age of four. So, and if you wanna see another video on education, we have one on our site called Jefferson's Tutor. So it goes through um, the education of Thomas Jefferson. So with that in mind, when they were in Holland, they said this about their children and what was happening to them over there. Because in, in Holland, the children had to work to help pay the bills, actually. So they were under a, a heavy burden and it's Bradford recorded this. He said, for many of their children that were of best dispositions and gracious inclinations, having learned to bear the yoke in their youth and willing to bear part of their parents' burden, were oftentimes so oppressed with their heavy labors that though their minds were free and willing, yet their bodies bowed under the weight of the same and became decrepit in their youth. They were so tired by the time they got home in the, in the evenings that they just couldn't focus on their studies. And it was very um, important to the, these, the Leiden church group is what we're talking about here, not the general passengers on the Mayflower, but the specifically the Leiden church group. And Bradford also said that they saw their posterity, which would be the succeeding generations, would be in danger to degenerate it and be corrupted. The American education system was birthed in the Reformation. It was not birthed in the Enlightenment. It was not birthed in the um, Renaissance. It was birthed in the Reformation. So that takes it back to Martin Luther and um, Geneva, Switzerland, specifically where Calvin and Zwingli and Knox and others worked together to put the Geneva Bible together. But both of them said that, and even um, Benjamin Church, signer of the Declaration of Independence and, and co-worker with Benjamin Franklin at the after the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, Benjamin Church started teaching about the importance of public schools. And he quoted the same thing that Martin Luther had, that if we don't have the Bible in our schools, our schools will soon become the wide gates of hell. So 
in Plymouth, they were concerned about what to do. And so they had a have some accusations starting to come up in as early as 1624. And here's one of the objections that was brought up in that town meeting. It says, children not catechized nor taught to read. Answer, neither is true. For diverse take pains with their own as they can. Indeed, we have no common school for one of a fit person or hitherto means to maintain one though we desire now to begin. They were concerned that they didn't have a organized school system. Well, in 1624, they only had like 100 people there. And so it was very easy for them to be able to teach in the home. But, and that's what they did. And they did the best they could. But here's another thing that we have to understand. One of the reasons that they didn't have a lot of food by the time they got off the Mayflower was because they brought whole entire sea trunks that are the size of a good size office desk full of books. They brought entire libraries of books with them on the Mayflower for education purposes. So they brought the classics, they brought the, um, the history books in Rome and Roman and Latin. And they brought the, as we saw before, they brought the Geneva Bible with them as well as volumes and volumes of useful knowledge, science, botany, farming, you name it, they brought it. And it says right here, Bradford, or historian Robert Bartlett said this about their literacy. He said, the number of volumes possessed by settlers in the colony was remarkable. Considering the size of the community, the high price of books and the scarcity of personally owned books in this era. Although admittedly, some of these were heavy theology and beyond the grasp of the average colonist, their presence nevertheless indicated a veneration of learning and the fact that their religion was related to the best Protestant thought of the day. The general dis distribution of the Bible in the Ainsworth Psalter proves that the majority did read and had a vital interest in their religion. So there we see it in a, in a historian relating about what I just said about the volumes of books and stuff that these people did. And it said almost every people, uh, almost every one of the pilgrims had their own personal Bible. And but between Brewster, Bradford, and Winslow, it says that they owned between three and 400 volumes of books that they brought with them. Some of them came over on the, um, the next year on another ship. But in their spare time, it says right here that Miles Standish and Ed, Edwin Winslow even learned to taught themselves the Indian dialect and William Bradford related that he taught himself Hebrew so that he could read the laws of God in the original God's breathed word. So we look here at this little side thing here and it's called youth. And like we said, it, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So here on the side panel, we see youth, and it's the woman with a young child, but she's holding a small book in her hand that I want to show you. Just one second. Now, of course, the pilgrims didn't have this little volume in their day and time because this wasn't first printed until 1690. 
and it's called the New England Primer. And though it, we would call it primer, but they called it primer. And this was the American textbook up until about 1930 when the National Education Association became, took over public education in America. And so one of the first things they did was get rid of the use of this book in schools. And it's real easy to understand why they would do that because it's all biblically based. And we even see here when it comes to the alphabet, it starts out with a, um, and the reason this book is so small is so a little child could hold it in its hands. And also it was easy for the, most of the kids would walk to school. So they would put it in their, their book bags or their pockets or different things like that. So, but we see right here for the word A, there is a um, little um, woodcut picture here that shows Adam and Eve with the serpent around the tree. I think maybe you can see it right there, right here. But it says, in Adam's fall, we send all. And then B, the next one says, heaven to find the Bible mind. Christ crucified for sinners died, and so on and so forth. And this is the way the children learned their alphabet, not only in um, picture form, but also in rhyming form, and also with a biblical context so that they would learn that this way. So that is what is depicted back here with our monument in youth. This is the other side of the statue of education. This would be on her left side. And this is wisdom. And the wisdom is the older guy here. He would be like the grandfather in the household, but he's the one that's developed the wisdom of age and experience. And also the Bible clearly teaches that the fear of the Lord, which is not afraid as a, in a negative sense, but the reverence and respect of the Lord of God is the beginning of knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. So they began the education with the knowledge of God so that they could know, know knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. But here we see the old man with a globe and an open Bible. So the old man is teaching the history of the world and God's creation, which would be natural law, which would be farming, agriculture, livestock, human relations, um, any, anything you can think of on a human level from a biblical point of view. So that's the original and um, this is the seated and accomplished act of education. So here we see the Mayflower Compact as the culmination of this whole thing. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pause at this point and we're going to do another um, recording to talk more in detail about this Mayflower Compact and then the early education laws of America and the results of those. So with that in mind, we are going to be back shortly with part two.